Hey everyone, welcome to co-designing delivery of good clinical care with GovCMS for the Commonwealth Department of Health. Thanks for coming along. Here's what we have in store today. A brief introduction to the Australian Immunization Handbook, who it's for and how it is used. A quick overview of our approach and the work done so far. The technical solution, outcomes we've achieved and lessons learned along the way. I'm Ranjit Alkunchwar, Lead UX Consultant and Delivery Manager at Folk, a strategic design consultancy. And I'm joined by my good friend and partner in crime, Anton Bagerman, Web Development Lead from MOFT, a specialist Drupal and GovCMS website development agency. Let's jump right in. The Australian Immunization Handbook guides health professionals in the safe and effective use of vaccines. Affectionately called the Immunization Bible, it is the authoritative source of all things immunization in Australia, and it is highly regarded globally as well. The handbook is produced by the Immunization Policy section at the Department of Health, but it also involves many other stakeholders, such as the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization, the National Health and Medical Research Council, and the Chief Medical Officer. The handbook started as a printed publication in 1975. The hard copy book was printed annually and mailed out. The 10th and latest edition had roughly 530 pages, A5 in size. Most professionals were known to have two copies, one for work and one for home. A broad range of diverse audiences refer to the handbook. Handbook users can have varying levels of domain knowledge, expertise, familiarity, and information needs. Frequency of use can also change based on the occupation. It is primarily used, however, by nurses and GPs. The handbook is used in two very different contexts. It is used as a textbook for nurse immunizer training courses. But more importantly, it is also used as an everyday reference by health professionals during consultations while they're actually with their patients. The user needs, as you can imagine, can vary significantly based on the context of use. Most common information seeking behaviors are known item finding and refinding. That means users typically know what they're after and often need the same information repeatedly. We observe that most hard copy users added tabs for quick and easy navigation to, to frequently used sections. The immunization landscape changes rapidly. To improve access for everyday users and to reduce the risk of out-of-date information, the hard copy content was digitized in 2013-14 using IBM Lotus Notes. From that point onwards, updates to the content were published first on the website while the hard copy was still uh, produced annually. Unfortunately, the web version failed to meet the needs of the audiences. It was found to be too clunky, cumbersome to use, and had a poor search function. Some users found the text to be too long, dense, and too technical. To get the up-to-date content, users would actually print updated chunks of content from the website and physically stick them into their book. I wasn't kidding when I said people love their book. Focus engaged in 2015 to help transform the digital presence of the immunization handbook to better meet the needs of health professionals and the department. Let's take a quick look at the work we've done so far. Digital transformation in government started gaining momentum in 2015 with the establishment of the Digital Transformation Office, now known as Digital Transformation Agency. Many of these now available guides were being developed while this project was underway. We introduced a three-stage product design and development approach. Discovery focused on understanding the users, their needs, and the right problems to tackle. Design focused on creating value propositions, testing hypotheses, ideation, and validation with users. And delivery focuses on delivering the best practice solutions. A multidisciplinary team was spun up. To better align with the departmental needs and cadence and, and the delivery schedule, the team was split across three tracks, also known as the tri-track agile approach. The tracks often ran concurrently. This enabled us to continuously 
uh, conduct discovery, design, and delivery. Extensive research has been conducted at various stages of the life cycle. It has shaped and informed the products and services we've developed. This is just a quick snapshot. We've utilized various methods, tools, and techniques at different stages. For instance, we leverage the jobs to be done framework to determine the right problems to solve early in the piece. We use value proposition canvas to create clarity and also help uncover new opportunities and ways to optimize existing offers. We leverage task models to better understand how users go about their everyday tasks, like creating a catch-up schedule and match those flows in the tools we develop. Because the entire handbook was rewritten, we leverage content readability benchmarks, card sorting, free testing, close comprehension tests to iteratively test and refine the content while it was being produced. The findings helped inform the content strategy. We continue to leverage analytics, um, user and stakeholder feedback loops to refine the products and services we've helped create. Let's quickly run through the key project milestones. The hard copy was published in 2013, digitized and published in 2013. Health began rationalization of their digital estate in 2015, along with the decision to move to GovCMS. Discovery research was conducted in 2015. A website alpha was developed in 2016, followed by a private beta. The handbook website was published in 2018. While the development was underway, the entire content of the handbook was rewritten. The team has continued to make ongoing refinements to both the website and CMS since launch. Work on the mobile app and the national catch-up calculator began in 2018 and progressively got delivered. A robust roadmap has been set up with exciting developments planned over the next 18 to 24 months. Let's take a look under the hood. The current handbook ecosystem includes the handbook CMS that is built with GovCMS 7, the handbook website, the data feeds, the native mobile apps for iOS and Android, which allow users to work in a disconnected state, and the web-based catch-up calculator. A complex content production and updates workflow was set up in SharePoint because while we were building uh, the CMS for the, for the department, content was actually already being produced. Let's take a closer look at how these components work together. The entire solution revolves around the single source of truth handbook CMS. We've used paragraphs extensively to build out the content model. As you can see, we are operating in the SaaS model. The handbook website hangs off the CMS. The website is publicly available and people can get to it using their web browser. They can download the chapters in a PDF format. The CMS generates XML or RSS data feeds for the mobile app using the RSS feed option in views. We created a separate display suite mode called feed for content entities such as nodes, paragraphs, beans, etc., to give us fine grained control over the output. We utilize view modes and templates to further rearrange the output and to remove redundant Drupal markup. The mobile app is developed using Xamarin, Microsoft's open source .NET platform. The app has been developed for iOS and Android and has a shared code base. On first use, the application downloads the entire handbook content, including the files. And from this point onwards, user can, users can work in an offline or disconnected state. The app looks for and automatically downloads new content when it becomes available. Another key component of the handbook ecosystem is the National Immunization Catch-Up Calculator. It helps health professionals quickly, efficiently, and accurately work up a schedule of vaccinations for people who have missed their immunizations. The National Catch-Up Calculator is a client-side, single-page web application built with Drupal's JavaScript API. It is a multi-step web form. It collects and processes data provided by the application user, validates the inputs against business rules, and generates and displays the output or the schedule itself. The catch-up schedule can then be viewed on screen and can also be exported as a PDF. We set up Google Analytics properties to track usage and monitor KPIs. Approved content 
currently being developed through the SharePoint workflow gets delivered to the content manager. And every time a node is published, the feeds are updated and the app would automatically download those. So that's everything in a nutshell. Let's quickly run through the outcomes we've achieved through this project. Here's a quick snapshot of the three products. The website was launched in September 2018, but has already registered 1.56 million users, 12.18 million page views, and 3.36 million sessions. Since launch in April 2020, the mobile app has already been downloaded 13,000 times. Launched in 2020, the calculator already amounts to 10% of the traffic to the website. Key benefits we've helped delivered for the department. Disinvestment in legacy tech in favor of whole of government solutions. Streamlined workflows for content production and publishing. Alignment with whole of gov guidance, processes, technologies, and platforms. Deduplication of content, which makes it really easy to maintain. Timely content updates and improved cadence, also with the reduced cost of hard copy production. Improved departmental capability. Reduce risk of out-of-date content, legacy tech, and also technical debt. Total ownership. The calculator was previously managed by the South Australian Department of Health. Now it is owned in-house. Robust evidence, product, evidence-based product roadmaps have also been set up. Key benefits for health professionals. Better content, which is much more easier to understand. A simpler, clearer, and better website. Significantly improved faceted search experience. Familiar but improved navigation. Helping people get to what they need quickly and easily. Offline access to the entire handbook, including the resources, through the app. Significant advantages over the hard copy, resulting in an increased adoption. Consistent experiences across health.gov.au, the handbook website, the catch-up calculator, and the mobile app, making everything easy to learn and use. I'd like, you, I'd like to take you through some key lessons that we've learned along the way. First and foremost, get stakeholder buy-in. No surprises there. None of this would have been possible without executive buy-in and a shared vision. Context is king. It's really important to understand the context and design for use. Design for how it is meant to be used. Develop a lean and agile mindset. Embrace design thinking, agile and lean. Adopt new ways of working and definitely go beyond just the daily standup. Think product over project. Project thinking focuses on the delivery of a predefined solution against a schedule, whereas product thinking focuses on the outcome. This was one of the biggest mindset change that we had to introduce and, and you know, get, get the department on board. They now own this, and this is an ongoing engagement. It is not a product with a definite, uh, sorry, it is not a project with a start and finish date. Validating early and often in order to create user-centered solution, that's a given. Uh, we've co-designed whenever possible, bringing all of the stakeholders into the same room. And we validated business, uh, validated with business and end users as many times as possible throughout the engagement. And lastly, a lot is possible, even in Gulf CMSS. Thank you. We'd love to take any questions that you might have. Anton, have you come across any questions? I'm not seeing any, any questions just yet. Suchi, can you help us with that? Don't seem to have see any questions. Oh, no worries. Yeah, 
people are seeing it's a great presentation which is great but we don't have any questions so i think we are done there so there is then one there is question how did you do the feeds anton would you like to would you like to tackle that the question is how did we generate the feeds so you might you might be on mute uh, yes, that would, <laughs> that would help. Um, so we decided on a fairly straightforward solution. So we use views for the feeds uh, in RSS mode. And to basically uh, format the content, we decided to use display suite and basically extract all of the, um, the Drupal content via a separate view mode in display suite, a uh, view mode called feed, very simple, which then gave uh, templates to um, to clean up some of the output that views RSS feed would produce. So we, could, we were able to um, take a lot of the HTML out of the feed. Um, we, with some pre-processed functions, we were able to mess out some of the data as well. So we kept it fairly, fairly straightforward and fairly simple. Yeah, one additional thing to call out there is we ran into some issues um, with conversion. So when, when the data was being added into Drupal, then being exported as RSS, then being ingested by a .NET app, um, you know, not, not all of that was fun. Um, so we had to look at um, pre-processing again and, and uh, regex functions that actually re replace these characters to, to make it more easy for the next step of the process. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, and because it was multi-level content with paragraphs, um, so the nodes would display the paragraphs in the feed mode, and whatever was in the paragraph would all be displayed via feed mode as well, the feed uh, view mode in display suite. It was a bit, a bit of quite a bit of work, but because we we had a SaaS environment and we're not able to develop our own modules, that was the simplest way to get around that, and it worked quite well. Yeah, and again, there was this really important distinction between what is an app versus what is a website. At the same time, both of them needed to have exactly the same content. So there they couldn't be any differentiation between the content that was displayed, but those two platforms are very different. The interaction models are different, so we had to approach them in a way that allowed people to make the most of it. Uh, there's nothing else coming up, uh, Ranjit. Someone had a question on the Q and A, but we can't see that. So. Okay. Yeah, the Q and A is closed. Um, so. Yeah. Can somebody who presented the question there also post it in the discussion forum? We are unable to see the Q and A at the moment. Okay, so that's Ms. Murray uh, being, a, being a very good attendee. Okay, one, one question here, Ranjit. Uh, what did our product team look like? And what, do, what are the future plans for D8 or D9? So we, we, we are currently in the process of determining what, what the next steps are. Um, it's probably going to be um, go up to D8 and then up to D9, but, but that remains to be seen just yet, depending on how the project goes. Um, I can see the one minute uh, countdown as well. So the other question was um, about the project team. So throughout the life of the project that we, we maintained a core team of people that got ramped up and down as necessary. So obviously we had a whole bunch of like an entire content team that was focused on writing the content, getting approvals, and that included people from all over Australia. And these are the experts in immunization. But uh, in terms of the product development team, we had designers, interaction uh, designers, uh, developers, um, uh, and sort of delivery manager and UXers kind of all working together. Um, but the team size and shape changed um, uh, as and when needed uh, across those three tracks that I mentioned before. 12 seconds left. Might have to say goodbye, Ranjit. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope you got something out of it. Feel free to hit me up um, on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you.